first time I ever came behind a pulpit in a pair of shorts. But let me tell you, I had to have this knee brace on. All right, so hit the shorts were it. Also, the first I had to use a cane coming up here. Um, a lot of us are ministry. We're very independent people. We don't like to lean on a lot of people, or let alone a cane. But uh, praise God, I appreciate this opportunity. Before I, you know, give you a little bit of update on the missions trip and um, Again, share with you what God has placed on my heart. Let me say a special thank you to everybody of this church. Um, now, it's been a month ago. I, I fouled up my knee. I ended up thinking uh, I'm like going to be 72. I thought I was still like 20, all right? So in one week's time, I, you know, bought 75, 80 bags of mulch. And I was over there at Home Depot, you know, and these you know, kids come to me. They want to load it. I said, hey, I don't need your help. I loaded them myself, ended up uh, laying all back there myself. My knee's starting to act up, and, uh, you know, you feel it. Then that same week, and then I walked four miles a day, you know, the end up was at that time. Then I played golf three times, 18 holes, 18 holes, and 27 holes the last day. And then I went down to Myrtle Beach for a day and had Diane in a wheelchair and took her down this rickety ramp and up. And then eventually when I went back down, I was going to sit on the beach. My leg set told me it was enough. And it's like, you know, the top bone went one way and the bottom bone went the other way. And down Bill goes, all right? And God trying to help me realize you are not 20 years old, all right? So uh, people have been asking me, you know, where we moved from Jersey uh, about, you know, it's slowly getting by. It's a slow process, all right? Very slow, but God's been teaching me something because we go over to Ghana and dealing with kids in wheelchairs and canes and everything else. Uh, you take for granted your mobility, can I say this? And um, also it's giving me empathy with my wife, all right? So it's God like teaching me a, a lot of lessons. But the thing I wanted to say thank you, during this time, church came behind us. Um, they brought meals, all right? I'm usually the, the cook of the family, all right? I, I enjoy eating, so I enjoy cooking. And so I wasn't able to stand up, but the church for two weeks supplied us meals. I, and um, cards and um, Matt checking up on us. You do not know the blessing of a church family until you're part of a family. Now, I can tell you as a former pastor, probably one of the toughest things is to retire from ministry as a pastor and to find a church family. That is very difficult, all right? Can I say, I can't say enough that I appreciate you, uh, Matt and Amy, as far as being our pastor and this church and the kindness and love that you've shown to us and you've accepted us here and a part of this family. And I'll just say it, and, and I know you say it from the point, this is a great family. All right, and sometimes you don't appreciate what you have until you don't have it. So just I'm saying, hey, you're in a good family. Enjoy, right? Now, after I said that, part of family, um, we're having the opportunity, as Matt said, be uh, going on a mission trip. Uh, we have a group of 17 this year, not all from this church, going to be going over to West Africa, Ghana, West Africa. But half the team is from Potter's Hand Bible Church, and. You know, Potter's Hand is not a gigantic church, but half of the team and the majority of the teaching ministry is from, all right, Potter's Hand Bible Church. And we're going over to Ghana. We'll be ministering to about 3,000 kids. I know you're getting ready to have Bible school, and you're going for 100, all right? And uh, figure, figure what 3,000 would be. Yeah, a, you might not want to figure that, but it's like, it's like, all right, it's only by God, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, the greatest thing about a mission trip is that you're never prepared for it, but God always is, and you get the front row seat of what God is doing and how he's able to use you even in, you know, you're never fully prepared or anything else. And so uh, we're, we'll say more about that later on, but there are prayer cards back there that you could pick up. I appreciate everybody helping um, on the big sale last week. I know at the end of this month, Hayden called me, all right, that we're going to have a barbecue. That's, and 
I, I kid around. When I was a pastor. I used to do things that were a little dubious. In other words, like I would go, all right, we're going to have a fellowship tonight, and it's going to be homemade ice cream, and we're going to choose who the best is. Now, of course, what, what it is is Pastor Bill wanted what? Ice cream, all right? And who was the judge? Ooh, baby, see, I don't know if you've ever done this, right? Oh, I would do all this kind of stuff, right? So we're having a barbecue because I like Hayden's barbecue, right? So, but, and a lot of people here like it, so we're going to do that at the end of the month. So remember, remember the team, God has been meeting our needs uh, in a miraculous way. And uh, one of the needs was I always like to have a nurse. And I didn't, well, I have two nurses going, I need them, all right? Two, I'm going to have two nurses and a physical therapist with me. So, that's, so but uh, so uh, from the church, in fact, two nurses, but how God has provided uh, for the team, but uh, and God providing all the necessary resources. But we do need your uh, prayers as we finish up all the details. And most of it, you know, is that God will prepare hearts. Part of this was what he did to me, is that my heart would be prepared for what he wants to do, all right, and that I would be right frame of mind that I would, uh, you know, in going over there. But just to remember us, prayer of God, meeting our needs. We have a, a team, half of young people to go over there. In fact, my, my best workers, all right, I'm sorry to say this, Arch, have always been teenagers. Man, and, and I hate to say this, guys, it's always teenage girls. <laughs> if I would have a choice between teenage girl and teenage boy, I hate to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you find out who the toughest is, all right, when you get over there. But please remember us uh, in your prayers, and I know that you are. Now, thinking about that, I want to share uh, uh, again what God has put on my heart and I'm going to relate it to what I have uh, just said. Um, I'm going to read, uh, and I guess we have the verses, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, uh, in chapter 11, verse 1, and verse 6, and then... I'm going to read a story in Mark chapter 5. Now, these are familiar verses, all right, in the book of Hebrews, all right, uh, talking about faith and we're to operate by faith. It says in verse 1, now, faith is the what? Substance of things hoped for, all right? Substance, the reality, all right? Something that is concrete but yet hoped for. Now, he's not talking about a pipe dream or something that you're just, you know, dreaming about, imagining. But he's talking about a hope that is built on the reality of God's word and God's promises. In other words, that I am believing that those promises are real, even though I haven't experienced them yet. They're real to me. They're as real as you know, as pulpit would be, the real as chairs are, as real as any of us. All right? That's what faith is. The substance of things hoped for. In other words, what lies before me is there. It's not going to fade away, it's not going to vanish. But then he adds, it's also the evidence of what? Things not seen. Now, I, I have a goal. That's why I look the hope. But you know what? I still have to live in this world, do I not? All right? I still have to walk the walk. I have to run the race that God has uh, for me. And Paul is talking about, I need to put my faith in uh, what now is not seen. Sometimes God asks me to, you know, in fact, sometimes, a lot of times, God asked me to take a step, even though it's scary, and uh, I'm kind of afraid, but I'm to step out no matter what I'm experiencing, whether it's fear or whether all different situations be around me, that uh, the hope is real, but also step by step, I'm trusting God on the evidence of things not seen and the one that is not seen. And the writer of Hebrews goes in verse 6, and he says, without this kind of faith, all right? It is impossible to what? To please God, for he that comes to God must believe that he is. All right? He is the all-sufficient one. He is the faithful one. And that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. I was involved in children's ministry for a lot of years, and you would try to drive home truths to kids in different ways. And uh, I was involved in the Wanda ministry probably uh, at least for 30 years. One of the things I, I, I would head the wand minister, we had a lot of kids and a lot of workers, but I liked doing things, all right? One of the things I liked was game time, all right? And I would come with all games that I wanted didn't have crazy games, all right? 
It's just I, I, I like doing this, all right? And uh, there was one game I called Walking in the Dark. I'm going to illustrate what I did. You two girls are unlucky to be right there. I'm sorry. <laughs> Would you two young ladies come up here a second, Matt? I'm going to need your help. I want to just illustrate a little bit what I've done. I'm going to have you guys go up there. Matt, would you help me? Um, this is a blindfold, the best I could do. But I want you to make sure you choose which. In fact, one of these young ladies is a visitor, right? Yeah, and your name is? Caitlin. Caitlin, do you trust this young lady? Yes. Okay. <laughs> then, then you're going to put that blindfold on Caitlin, all right? You really trust her, eh? Make sure, so you see that little notch there where the nose is? Just switch that over a little bit to the left. Yeah, yeah. keep on going. Oh, back, right there. Yep. Now, I'm going to make sure you can't see underneath that, right? Yeah. Uh, you, can you see? No. No, all right. We're really tight. Now, let's take her over here, Matt. All right, right to that side. No, I'm sorry. Now. This day, I know, but this is it. Well, they're, they're never coming back, but that, don't worry. You stay right here. I want you to turn around about three or four times and just have her face any direction you want her to face. All right. Right there. All right. Now, what I would do, I had a gym, all right? And I would have hundreds of kids, all right? And I would have like four or five teams, and they'll all be in a line. Because, you know, with kids, they're all screaming, the elementary kids, right? And the thing of it is, is that I would have the, everybody, you know, on different teams blindfolded. And I would have one person, you'd be in be teams of two. You're going to lead her over. Do you see where that mic is? But you can't touch her. And you've got to stay at least three feet away from her. But now, she could fall down these steps. Man, you could twist an ankle. Am I right? I mean, you got good insurance, right? <laughs> now, so you, and you're going to try to get her over there, all right? Let, uh, now, you picture when I did it, like I said, there was four different teams, kids all around the board screaming, screaming, different teams screaming. They're trying to hear what this person said. Try to lead her to the other side. I want you to see something, all right? Well, I'd be careful. That is good. You did better than I wanted you to do. You can stop right there. All right, you can take a blindfold off. You guys can have a seat. But I want you to notice something, all right? You do trust her, don't you? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> but did you notice her stride was very what? Very short, am I right? Because when you can't see something, it's kind of scary. Of course, I had it in, in an environment, I, I mean, kids bumping in the wall, tripping over each other and everything else, all right? They were afraid of falling and then add the yelling and everything else. Can I tell you this? We as grown-ups are the exact, exact same way. We don't like the dark either. And uh, the older you get, the worse it is, all right? We complain about walking where we can't see and complain about driving with limited vision, all right? You end up, you ever get behind an old man like me or, or maybe somebody, and they're driving so slow at night because they, I mean, when we first moved down here, and I know we live uh, in Fuqua and go down Sunset Lake Road. There's, I mean, we lived in New York, New Jersey. I mean, there's street lights. It's like they didn't discover that, you know, down these country <laughs> roads. And you'd be in the pitch black, right? And so you, I'd be slowing down every curve because you didn't know which way? But this is natural. As, you, as we get older, we take baby steps. We drive slow because we can't see. Now, here's the reality in life. We are all, in a very real sense, blindfolded, living in the darkness. Are we not? We don't know what the future holds. Got great plans, you know, going down and expanding. But you don't know what's going to unfold tomorrow. I don't know what's going to unfold tomorrow or the weekend, we have no vision beyond the present moment. That truth was driven home to me when I messed up my knee, all right? See, I had my plan. I'm one of these guys, I like uh, doing everything, all right? I mean, just involved in everything, all right? And I could visualize my plan. This is how it's going to work out and everything else, all right? And can I say, in my plan, the injury was not in it, all right? It was not in that, all right? 
I mean, I wasn't planning on taking canes, all right, to Ghana, or checking out every knee brace, trying to find, you know, what the best knee braces are. But uh, God had that in my path for a given reason. And even though this has really limited me and I'm uncomfortable with it, God is before me saying, you just keep on stepping. You can't see what I'm doing. You have some pain. You have some discomfort. You're uneasy, a little afraid of falling. But you just keep on what? Stepping one step at a time. See, that's what the Christian life is, is it not? And God, many times, that's what he does things to us or allows things to happen in our lives that we would understand that he is sufficient and we can trust him just like you were able to trust in leading us down that path. See, we're all like that little, you know, blindfolded Awana child, grope in a, in a dark room listening tr for the familiar voice. See, the, it was different because it was nice and quiet in here. But if everybody's screaming and you're trying to, in all those voices, listen for that one voice that you can trust, all right? Now, the one difference, you know, in life, if we be honest, our surroundings aren't always friendly, right? Aren't always familiar. We can be in a hostile, fatal environment. No, I mean, worst fear, I mean, we talk about like maybe going down that step or, you know, stub a toe or whatever. Man, there can be a lot of other things in life that come our way. With cancer, divorce, loneliness, death. And try as we might to walk as straight as we can, all right? Chances are, in this life, you're going to get hurt. You're going to feel pain. Yet in the midst of all that, God calls us to walk the walk of faith, listening for his voice. We don't panic. We don't stop. Even though sometimes, man, our steps are, doesn't, don't look quite as confident as they but we still keep on going forward. Now, keeping that in mind, I want to read a story, all right, that illustrates uh, that truth. And that story is in Mark chapter 5 about a man by the name of Jarius. all right? Now, Jarius, man who tried to walk as straight as a line as you could. In other words, type of individual, I'm sure like most of us. In other words, I want to do what's right. I want to be what's right. I want to be the right type of man, the right type of father, mother, all right, woman, all right? This is who Jarius was, all right? In the days of Christ, I'm going to read the story, he was the leader of the synagogue. That means he literally was the most important man in the community. Everybody knew who Jarius was because the synagogue was the center of religious activity but also of social activity, all right? So everybody knew, all right, who he was. And the leader of the synagogue was not only the senior religious leader, but he, he was literally like the professor. He would be like the teacher, like the mayor, best-known citizen, all right? And it's almost like, I mean, that's everything you could hope for. But I'm going to read the story. Jairus hoped for something else. In fact, the situation is going to be that his daughter is very, very sick. And in his mind, there's the possibility that his daughter is going to die. And he can't see into the future, all right? So fear is grip, gripping his heart, all right? What happens if she dies? And uh, he's going to go to Jesus. In fact, uh, in the story you'll, you'll see, he doesn't barter with Jesus, doesn't uh, negotiate with Jesus. And again, this is an important man, but he ends up, he literally pleads with our Savior that he would come. And um, what you have in the story is Jesus is going to go to the man's house. Now, I want you to catch this, all right, what's really going on here. I personally believe the main thrust of the story, Jesus is not doing this mainly for the 12-year-old girl. 12-year-old girl is going to die. But now follow me. She's going to die. She's going to be where? In heaven, better off, all right? Jesus is doing this for who? For Jarius. He has some things he needs to learn, all right, in the faith life. And it's the same way with us, all right? God, I believe, allows situations to come in life. He wants to teach us some lessons. And I want you to see, I'm going to give you three lessons that I got from this story, but and that I'm applying to myself, but also I believe that we applied to in all of our lives. Let's see if you can pick them out. Let me start reading verse 21. 
It says, Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, when he saw him, or saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. In other words, hey, forget about being the man. Forget about, in other words, having position. I, I'm literally going to beg Jesus that he would come with me. And he begged him earnestly, fervently, all right? My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her, that she would be healed, she would live. I, I, I don't know what's going to happen, and I'm afraid the worst is going to happen. So come with me. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged, all right? So what you have is Jairus leading Jesus, convincing Jesus to go with him, at least he thinks, all right, and leading Jesus to his home. While he was still speaking, some came from the roar of the synagogue's house and said, Your daughter is what? Dead. Why trouble the teacher any longer? Very interesting. The teacher. All right, they didn't understand who Jesus was. In other words, there's no use bringing him any longer because there is what? There, there's no hope. All right. There's no reason to bring him. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the roar of the synagogue, don't be afraid, only believe. Wait a minute. I mean, I'm bringing you that my daughter would be healed, and now I have news she's dead, and you're telling me, you know, don't worry, don't sweat it. Just believe. You believed in me when we started the trip? Well, keep on believing, all right? And he says, just believe in me. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and he saw a tumult, a great number of people who wept and wailed loudly. And to say, if you ever visit Israel and you have a Jewish wedding, especially back in that time, I mean, <laughs> weeping and wailing, be, be, I mean, take it beyond, all right? It's a literally, in other words, uh, I, I, it's almost like I know when we moved in, um, up near the New York area, if you would ever go to uh, an Italian wedding, I, I mean, Italian funeral. And by the way, love Italians is not that. But I still remember I was going to do a, a funeral, and it's literally the lady was getting in the casket, all right, with, with her I mean, it was just, I mean, very emotional, all right? So I'm going to say, this is what's going on here, all right? It's almost like Bedlam it is there, all right? And uh, when he came in, he said to him, Why are you so upset? Why all the commotion? Why weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. I'm sure they're like, oh, wait a minute. I mean, there's something wrong. And they ridiculed him. They mocked Jesus. But when he had put them all outside... He took the father and mother of the child, and those that were with him entered, with the child, entered where the child was lying. And he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talithi Komai, which is translated, Little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age. I believe it's the first time he brought anybody back from the dead. All right, And they were overcome with great amazement, but he commanded them strictly that no one should know it. And said that something should be given to her to eat. All right? I, I, I'm a dad. We have seven children. I cannot imagine. I just think of what was going on in this. I mean, you're talking about height, hope, no hope. I mean, I, I mean, now girl alive. Let me give you three things I think we, I, I'm learning, and this is what we need to learn. Number one, I need to determine I'm going to see the unseen. You need to determine in your Christian life you will see the unseen. Remember I read Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, faith is the evidence of things not seen. As a Christian, as a believer, I need to determine I will see the unseen. Before Jesus and Jairus got very far in that story, they were interrupted, right? Interrupted by people from the house, his house, saying, your daughter is dead, you don't need to bother the teacher any longer and it's very interesting what happens because you find a shift that was going to happen here right up to this point at least jarius is thinking i'm convincing jesus to come and i'm leading jesus but now it's going to switch that jesus is going to be convincing jarius all right to keep on going 
and Jesus is the one that's going to be leading it, all right? And in verse 36, when they came there, it's very interesting, I was looking at different translations. There's one translation in verse 36 says, Jesus paid no attention to what they said, all right? In other words, they came and they're saying, the child's dead, the child's dead. Jesus chooses to pay no attention. And I love that, all right? Because there's a principle there, all right, for seeing the unseen. A lot of times you've got to ignore what people say, all right? It's almost you've got to put cotton in the ears. You've got, you have to block them out. You have to ignore many times in your life, all right? You know God is leading you a certain direction, and there's people who are going to come, and they're going to tell you, hey, it's too late to start over. Hey, this can't be done, all right? You can't amount to anything, all right? And you have to choose. I'm not going to listen to them. And Jesus not listening to them, and he turns immediately to Jarius in that verse 36, and he says, don't be afraid. Don't listen to what they're saying. You just believe. And many times I'm telling you in the Christian life, all right, everybody wants to give us their opinion, what can be done, what can't be done. All right? And we need to determine to listen to that one voice that we're going to see the unseen, no matter how hard it is. And Jesus is compelling Jairus to see the unseen. He is imploring him, don't limit your possibilities to the visible. All right? Just because you can't see it, just because somebody else says a certain thing, all right, just because you can't understand it, don't be controlled by the logical Believe there is more to life than meets the eye. I believe that. I've never seen heaven. You've seen heaven? Never, I, but I believe with all my heart, all right, there is a city of light that we are traveling to. That, that is real to me, and that's what he's telling. All right, Jairus, trust me. Don't be afraid. See the unseen. You still, you at the beginning of this journey saw me going into your home laying my hands on your daughter, bringing her back, all right, to health. I want you to continue to see that same thing. Trust me. You know what we need to do? Uh, well, I don't know whether knees or whatever. We need to get a vision of who Jesus is, all right? See, the people that came and they say, you know, tell the teacher to go home. Well, you understand it's not just a teacher that's gone with Jarius. He is the almighty God. I love in Hebrews chapter 1, it says, In these last days he's spoken to us by his Son, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Jesus is the Almighty God. One of the great stories in the Bible is to go back to Genesis, all right, chapter 17, when God is dealing with Abraham. And he's telling Abraham, you know, you're going to have a son and you're going to have a great number of heirs. Problem is, is Abraham is 99 years old. Man, kind of tough, you know. Abraham gets up in the morning, looks in the mirror, and goes, I just don't believe going to happen, all right? Looks at his wife, a couple of years younger than him. I just don't believe. You know what God ends up telling him? He says, I am the all-sufficient God. In other words, what he's telling Abraham, he says, I am enough. I know you're not enough, all right? But I'm enough. And that is literally what Jesus is telling Jairus. Just keep on trusting me. I am enough. And I'm saying in the Christian life, I need to determine to see the unseen. See, I'll, I'll look at it and go, oh, I heard here, there, and there. I don't know if I can do this. And it's almost like the Lord, you, know, you hear his voice saying, you never could do it, Bill. I am the sufficient one. You're not the sufficient one. And he wants Jarius to learn this, all right? Learn and determine that you would see the unseen. It's like how Paul wrote uh, in 2 Corinthians 4, 18. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And Jarius made the choice. He opted for faith, faith in Jesus. But you know what? I would have loved to see him as he was walking to the house. I don't believe he was striding big steps of confidence. No, he was gone, but he had some doubt 
mixed in with his faith. Am I right? But we need to turn by the grace of God. I'm going to see the unseen, and I'm going to keep on stepping forward. Maybe at times my faith might not be the greatest, but I'm going to continue to take those steps. Let me give you the second lesson quick. Don't let the noises of this life distract you. Don't let the noises of this life distract you. When Jesus arrives at the house, what's going on? There's mourners all over the place. And he tells them that the child is not dead, only asleep, and they laugh at him. All right? And in verse 40, when they read these words, it says, he put them outside. Now, if you just looked at in the English translation, oh, you know, would you please go outside? That's not what Jesus did. You need to understand in the original text, it's the same verb, all right, used here that when Jesus kicked out the money changers out of the temple. And it's the same verb that's used 38 times when he cast out demons. He didn't say, would you kindly leave? He threw them out. Understand what was going on, right? He had uh, no patience uh, for these. There was no tolerance there. Think about this. Why was Jesus so intolerant of those people that were there? What do you think? Because their wailing, their crying, their commotion was affecting not Jesus, but was affecting who? It's affecting Jarius. Am I right? And uh, it would distract Jarius in his journey of faith. And we have to be careful. I don't know about you. Noises of this world. Just like, like I said when we did that game in Awana, and they would have all those noises going on, right? You would just contact every kid yelling and screaming. And you're trying to block out all those noises just to hear the one voice. Can I say that's how life is, isn't it? Anybody ever had the enemy whisper in your ear? And then you got people, I mean, all around you. They all want to share what they think. I mean, and all these noises. And we have to understand, all right, I cannot allow the noise of this world to distract the vision that God has given me. I used to say there's two kinds of people in the congregation. There's firefighters, and that's people whose job they think it is to put out fires. And what I mean by that, you're going to fire to serve God, and I'm going to try to explain to you why you can't do that and why God is not going to accomplish that, right? Then there's fire lighters. That's the one I like. They're the people you want to be around. It's like they fan your flame, all right? They ignite you because they are on fire for God. Don't let the firefighters put out your vision, is what I'm saying, all right? And we have to determine, because the voices are going to be all around you, all right? If you want a reason to stop, they're there. Last one, you've got to keep the right perspective. Last lesson, keep the right perspective. When we read Hebrews chapter 1, it says that faith is the what? Substance of things hoped for, all right? When Jesus encountered the mourners, he's troubled by their wailing. Follow me. It bothered him that they were having such anxiety over death. Why are you so upset? Literally, it's like, why are you so upset? Why are you crying and making so the child is not dead? Why did Jesus say that? Because his perspective of death was totally different than their perspective, all right? Literally, from his perspective, that little girl is what? Not dead. All right? Physical death, necessary step, say the Lord returns in our lifetime, to pass from this world to the next. Death is not an end. Death is what? Beginning. And Jesus could not, you know, why you so, you know, would you say you believe something, but yet when you are called upon to live out that belief, you don't. It's like I like to relate like this. I don't know how many of you, as you raise kids, and I know uh, our kids, man, when they would go out and play, in a, they would get filthy, right? I mean, dirty and everything else. And you have supper time, all right? The eight time I was raised that you were able to, you know, most of the meals ate together as a family. And when the kids would come in, all right, you would ask them to do what? They got to wash up. They got to clean up, right? Uh, and especially, you know, if you had their favorite meal, all right? Did they ever complain about cleaning up? Leave mine. No. Small price to eat, right? I'll clean up. You're going to feed me, all right? Can I say, 
from God's perspective, death is a small price to pay to sit at his table. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like from, he, he sees it different than we see it. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, again, Paul says it this way, This I say to you, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. This corruptible must put on incorruption, or mortal must put on immortality. All right? See, God's just as insistent as our, in fact, more since than our parents, change of clothing has to happen before you're going to come into my house. All right? From God's viewpoint, death is not to be dreaded. All right? It's to be welcome. Uh, I didn't understand until I got older. You don't want to live forever. And it, as you get old, you want to stay in this body for this look. You know, you look back and you see what's happened in the years. You want to go 100, 120, 140, and keep on decaying? No, 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 no. That's why when Paul talks in the Bible, he says that we in this house, we moan. Yeah, that's why as old people, we moan. Because we're in this house of flesh, and it gets older, and it's uh, hard to drag it around, Right? And uh, so from his viewpoint, death is not, re it's to be welcomed, all right? So what I'm saying is that i got to keep right perspective of life, all right? These mourners had a wrong perspective. Sometimes I make it everything, you know, about my plan or this or here and there. God, we need to have a perspective built upon the Word of God. And I live in that perspective. Mark it down. I believe this whole mark. God knows we're blind, right? <laughs> he knows, uh, and he also knows living by faith does not come naturally. It doesn't come naturally to me. I don't know to anyone else, all right? That's the reason he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, not for her sake. She's better off in heaven. But to teach us, all right, to learn to trust him. You put your trust in him. I heard a cool analogy, and I like this, all right? Years, uh, years ago, in fact, especially uh, during the time, New Testament was written when a ship was, um, you know, uh, in a storm coming near port and end up the ship is rocking unstable. What they would do to stable the ship so it wouldn't be driven, they would cast out the anchor. Now follow me. Can you imagine the captain of the ship? The ship's in a storm. It's being thrown away. I'm going to put the anchor. I'm going to put the I cast it, but I'm going to cast it in the ship. So he takes the anchor and he puts it out on the bow of the ship. The ship is still what? Being tossed to and fro. Well, I know. I'll put it on the back deck. Ship is still being tossed. Am I right? Well, I'll take it down to the hold, right? Put that. It's not until you put the anchor in the depth of the sea that stabilizes. Can I say the stabilization factor in all of our lives is not us. You can't trust in yourself, but we trust in the all-sufficient God. And then we just keep on walking step by step. Sometimes our steps might not be big strides. Sometimes they might be small. But we can trust him. He is the all-sufficient God. So whether it's a journey, going on a mission trip, whatever it is that you're facing, can I say this? You can trust him. And, the, you know, the cool thing about it is the journey where God takes you, it's always very, very exciting. And you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss it. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around for a second. I want to do what Matt does uh, every Sunday, give you an opportunity to respond to the Word of God. Jesus always did this as he preached truth. He gave people an opportunity to respond. Maybe you're, you're here in a situation you know, similar to Jairus. Maybe it's not you know death of a child, but you have a situation in your life, and you're afraid what tomorrow holds. And... Um, could be that God's allowed this to come into your life, in other words, to teach you some things, all right? That you would have the right perspective of life, that you would just shelter, get, get rid of all those noises that are yelling ar around you, and that you would see the unseen, that you would see Him, and you would hear His voice. Maybe it's almost this morning you can hear His still small voice saying, just like He said to Jarius, trust me, don't be afraid. Trust me. Maybe this morning you need to come and just bow at this altar and say, Lord, I'm going to make a choice. I'm not going to give in to fear. I'm not going to give in to anxiety. I'm not going to give in to doubt. But I'm going to choose to trust in you.
and to keep on walking forward. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that this invitation time that you would do and have your way in each of our hearts. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen.